Thanks for joining me. So I'm going to talk about security today. I'm Buck Hodges, Director of Engineering for Visual Studio Team Services. And a lot of security talk can be very dry, very boring. I want to change that. So we're going to start with, what does a security conversation look, look like normally? Because one of the biggest challenges, and this is sort of my whole crux here, the biggest challenge with security isn't, isn't actually doing it so often as much as it is convincing people to go do it. And so this is the problem we're going to talk about today. So how many of you have been involved in these kind of conversations? Well, how real is that threat? Our team is good, right? I don't think that's possible. We've never been breached. Can't be a problem, right? Endless debate about value. Should I go invest in security? Should I work on features? I should ship more features, right? So how do we deal with that conversation? How do we change the game there? And so my whole talk here is about shifting the conversation from a debate about the value of it to a concrete conversation about where to invest and how. So we'll start here with this quote from, from Michael Hayden, who was former director of NSA and, and CIA. And he says, fundamentally, if somebody wants to get in, they're getting in. Accept that. What we tell clients is, number one, you're in the fight whether you thought you were or not. Number two, you're almost certainly penetrated. And this is a pretty stark statement here, is you're going to get breached. What are you going to do about it? So to start with here, there's, there's a mindset shift. There, there's sort of two main things here, right? There's preventing a breach, and there's assuming a breach will happen. The prevent breach has threat modeling in it, code review, kind of all the things that, that you've heard about and know you should do, and they're very valuable. They're very valuable activities. At the same time, they're not enough. Because the thing with an attacker is an attacker only has to get a few things right to get in. You have to get everything right to keep them out. It's a very asymmetric balance in the equation there. So the mindset of assuming breach is really about thinking about, all right, if it's going to happen, am I prepared? How do I deal with that? How do I detect that I'm being attacked? How do I handle it if something does happen? What's my response plan? What am I going to do when it happens? How do I recover? All these questions that, you know, if, if I don't have some means of, of dealing with this becomes really panic in an emergency. Part of this, too, is ongoing life site testing of your response mechanisms. So let's say you've done some security. Today you've got alerting on, hey, when something happens, this alert's supposed to fire. These people are supposed to do something. We have that, too. We started testing this. We'd go do stuff that would trigger alerts. Three days later, we get an email. Huh, that didn't work too well, did it? Right? So do you really know whether or not your detection mechanisms are actually going to help you? Are they going to respond fast enough? And then when you think about attacks, once the attacker gets in, what do they have access to? Security is something where it's all about layers. And People often think, hey, if I'm on CorpNet, if I'm on my corporate network, if I'm inside my firewall, I'm safe. And that becomes an attacker's greatest dream because once they get through your first layer of defense, everything else is, is just awesome, right? How many, how many internal websites have you seen that have major security flaws because they all assumed, hey, this is safe. I'm, in, I'm inside the corporate firewall. I don't, I don't have to think too hard about it. And then... As part of this, you need to think about once, once you run, and we're going to talk about running exercises here around breaches, what's your assessment afterwards? How do you react afterwards? What, what do you do? So the first thing is, is, is the shift in mindset. Many people, and us included, right? I spent this whole time talking about TFS, the on-prem product. We moved to the cloud. When you're, in the cl when you're on-prem, you've got a server, you've got domain admins, you've got private IP addresses. You're not exposed to the internet. Then you start running services and it all shifts, right? You go from thinking about domains to thinking about subscriptions. Who's got access to your subscription? How do you manage those secrets? You've got a bunch of IP addresses for endpoints for your various services that are online. How do you deal with that? And this is where we do something internally, and a lot of other companies do as well, called red versus blue. Red teams and blue teams. And this is key to changing the whole conversation around security. So what is red versus blue? Red versus blue literally means you spin up a team, a red team, that goes and attacks your service. 
And you have a blue team whose whole goal is to detect and thwart the attackers. And forming a red team, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, but it's really about taking either external people or internal people, and quite honestly, I think, you know, uh, certainly early on, an ideal combination is to have both, is to pair external pen penetration uh, t uh, testers with people in your team because the most interesting attacks require knowledge of your service. You know, people can scan, rig and run scan tools, those are valuable. They'll find things like, let's say, a deserialization vulnerability or something. All good stuff, you go fix it. But the most interesting attacks string together multiple uh, issues, and those are best identified by people who are deep into the system, who really understand it well. So red versus blue, you have a, an actual event where you've got a set of people who go attack your system, and that could be a week, it could be months. You know, there are any number of ways you can structure it. Typically, uh, we do a few days to a week for an event. And then the blue team, meanwhile, is trying to figure out what's happening. They're monitoring. Now, early on when we started, we really had a blue team spun up to go look at the system while the red team was attacking. But how often did attackers warn you ahead of time? Say, hey, get ready. You know, they don't. Now, early on when we started this, we were so bad at it that we could tell the blue team it was happening and it didn't really matter. They, they were screwed. So the, the key is, is <laughs> key for them, blue, and blue team is a character building exercise. So it's really starting to think about, okay, the red team did something. So often early on you find out later what they did, doing the forensics and then asking yourself, they did these things, can we tell what they did? Do we understand what impact they really had? How do we detect them? And it takes years, and I'll show you the progression, but it took a long time. Now, I love these things. I love security. I, I love red team events. They are so fascinating because the creativity that people will apply to break into services has no limit. Has no limit. It's fantastic. And it's also a mindset where these are people who don't see rules. So often engineers and developers, when they write a piece of code, they think about how it should work. The attacker thinks about everything but the right way for it to work, right? So when I run these events, and they, they run across Microsoft, so this is not at all unique to us, but I always require proof. I want to see, can you, can you prove to me that you got in? And we'll talk about the rules and engagement for a moment, in a minute, but this is MSN. What do you notice is happening here? I go to the main dashboard and it rotates upside down. But I want proof. Again, I want to change the conversation. I can come talk to you about what might be possible, but if I show you something like that, if you click on your home page and it rotates on you, I got your attention, right? <laughs> so the red teams also are very clever. Again, they're creative people. Every time somebody clicked on the MSN home page when they had exploited this particular vulnerability, which happened to be a cross-site scripting error uh, a vulnerability, they, they wired it up so that when you viewed the dashboard, it voted on the work item to go fix this vulnerability. So you, <laughs> it had 280 votes to go fix this vulnerability. Somewhere there's a persistent cross-site scripting error vulnerability somewhere in VSTS. It was really, really clever. But I demand proof. Don't tell me what, what you might have been able to do. Show me what you did. So here's here's kind of the evolution for us of, of red versus blue. Before we started it, we did a variety of things to, to try to uh, improve security. And it's not that we were doing a bad job. It's just you can always get better. And this is one of the things that, in my mind, has really shifted and improved our security posture more than anything else that we've done. But we, we would identify, and we still do, identify vulnerabilities through manual code review. It's a good exercise. We had engaged an external pen testing company, and they came and they did stuff, and they gave us a report, and there were a few things in there to go fix, and it was interesting, but it wasn't super interesting. There is only but so much you're going to get out of scans, and there are a variety of tools that you can go either purchase as services or buy outright or whatever to use to do scanning. They're valuable. You should do it. But it's kind of, it's really getting started. That's not the interesting stuff in a lot of cases. And it's just kind of the basics. So we engaged an external pen, pen testing company. We would also uh, do report outs to the team. And this, by the way, is, is really key. And we do this all the time now. We, in fact, did our latest red team report a couple of weeks ago. 
when you go have the conversation with the team and you show them what you've broken in their code. So if I come to you and I say, hey, here's this interesting vulnerability in, I don't know, Internet Explorer or whatever, and you go, ha ah, those guys are stupid. Can't believe they did that. That would never happen to me. Right? It's very easy as a human to dismiss it because your ego is saying, yeah, it wouldn't happen to me. But when I come to you and I present, I broke your code. Here's how I got into your code. It changes your mindset. And the result of these red team events has been people will actually make statements. I, I love it every time I hear one in the hallway. Yeah, I don't want to show up in the next red team event. Right? I don't want my code being there. Because we all know, some of you are probably familiar with threat modeling. It's in the presentation. I won't get to it today, but you can look at it in the slides. But threat modeling is a great exercise, but you tend to only do it when you design new features. Everybody knows, of course, you can introduce a massive vulnerability with a single line of code change. It's happened to us. Years and years ago, somebody modified uh, a code path on, uh, that, where we evaluate the tokens, the, the JWT, the JALT tokens, uh, that we use for authentication. They thought they were modifying a code path that was only used in testing. They took out the signature validation. Turns out they took it out for everything. Um, that was terrible. It was a one-line change. Changed a Boolean variable. And, and introduced a massive vulnerability. So I want people to think about security all the time. Every time they write a line of code, I want that in their heads. I can't mandate doing threat models or any other you know, big process around just making a line of code, or change, code uh, changing a line of code. You never get anything done. But if I've got it in your head, then it, you're going to do a better job inherently than if it's not on your mind. Um, Part of those earlier exercises helped us identify, too, people who kind of think creatively. One of the coolest things that happened, by the way, in the, in the pre-red red team days, uh, one of the engineers decided, hey, I think I can make use of the fact that .NET and SQL treat strings differently. That, say, a Cyrillic barred O is a Cyrillic character. The weighting of it in string comparisons, if you haven't set up your parameters correctly, is different between .NET and SQL. He was able to take that small little fact, and he, had a, he demonstrated, he wrote a PowerShell script. He could go from being a guest in the, in the, just a regular user in an account to a deployment admin by exploiting that vulnerability. And this was four or five years ago now. But it's, it's, it's that level of creative thinking of, about just what are the differences? How, how do I do that? So there were a few people on the, on the team who kind of had this kind of mindset of they like to break things. And those are the people that you want to find in your company and pair them up with external pen testers who will bring into your team knowledge of, of how to go about pen testing, be it tools, be it processes, be it mindset. And you can really cross-pollinate between the people who understand and know how to do pen testing in general and the people on your team who can think creatively but also deeply know your code. They know where the body's buried. They know the interesting stuff to go after. And then we'd also, as we started this in 2015, as we hired a, a pen tester, um, who was actually really good, very, came very, uh, came uh, recommended, we, we paired up some uh, sort of ops-minded engineers to, to become the blue team. And this was early on, so you could warn the blue team. And like I say, it unfortunately didn't matter at the time. They couldn't find the red, red team. And the, the attacks start off with things that are just truly embarrassing. And, and I'll show you some of those. Where... Secrets are poorly protected. How many people have ever put a secret on a share, on a file share? Right? You think, oh, man, I would never do that. That's the stupidest thing ever. Every team at Microsoft that goes through and does red teaming, the red team goes and scans file shares, and they inevitably find secrets. So if you do it, you will find them in, in, your, in your company. Uh, they also found SQL injection. The, the, one of the SQL injection vulnerabilities they found over, over time was actually pretty, pretty cool. We, we go to great lengths to prevent SQL injection vulnerabilities. I talked in the architecture talk about having a, uh, a SQL resource component layer that we use where everything goes through. We use stored procs. We almost never build dynamic SQL. Almost. Well, there was that time <laughs> when somebody got it wrong. And there was 38 characters that you could make use of for SQL injection. And the red team couldn't figure it out. So they went to the best SQL engineer on the team and said, well, we've got these 38 characters. Can you come up with a way to do SQL injection? And he did. <laughs> he, he figured out that he could use that to upload data into a temp table. And so 38 characters at a time, he could write uh, a new SQL string 
into a temp table. And at the time, we changed this, you could execute SQL straight out of a temp table. So after he uploaded it, he executed the SQL in the temp table, boom, they owned us. And he actually could have done it in fewer characters. He didn't need all 38. <laughs> so, but that's that level of creativity. They spotted a little bit of a hole, they found the right expert, and they figured it out. Um, so going through these, these exercises, this, this was really for us kind of a, uh, a major milestone, a real shift in how we approached security. So we were actively going and finding and attacking, uh, finding problems and attacking our own service. We also started using phishing campaigns. We would do tests, and I'll show you some results of that. Phishing is amazing. Like, okay, you find a zero day, you've got time to use it until somebody patches it. But there was somebody was joking online, you know, teach man to fish, he, he can get in forever. Phishing is just so phenomenally successful, and it changes what you have to do to protect yourself. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So then in 2016, we, we further augmented the team with outside experts, meaning other red team members across the company. So Windows has a red team, Office 365 has a red team, Azure has a red team, IT has a red team. They're really good. They're very smart people. Anywhere you can start leveraging other people, you should do it. So we started borrowing, begging. Hey, could we have one of your people for three days? And they were very nice. They would lend us somebody for three days. Um, and what was interesting about that is that we learned new techniques that way. Just like with the external folks, with the internal folks, we also learned new ways to do things. They introduced, introduced us to new tools, new ways to think about things. And at that time, we were thinking about things like cross-site scripting, the engineering system itself, deserialization vulnerabilities, some really creative ones um, that involve some of the features in the product that I won't go into. But that was also the time when we started really thinking hard about how do we, how do we stop losing? <laughs> like the red team always wins. How do we change this equation? So we spent a lot of time thinking about logging, thinking about what else we could do for post-breach forensics. Because when, when they break in, do you really know what they did? And 2017, uh, we've, we've improved quite a bit. It's now, it takes the red team a lot longer to get in. And you go, yeah, but you still lose. You're right, still lose. Still sucks that way. But you can see a clear progression in the effort that it takes over the years. It's so much better now than it was then. You're never done with security. It's never perfect. But what's interesting is you look at all this, and, and I'll tell you about Calypso here in a minute. But this changed the equation. So when we did our first red team attack back in 2015, we found credentials on shares, some crazy stuff like that. And when Brian found out about it, Brian's head exploded. It's like, what? What kind of idiot does that? Let's fire those people. So it, 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 it elicits a, a very strong response. And then, of course, he calms down and starts thinking about it. And then we talk about, OK, everybody kind of goes through this, et cetera. But at that point, it, I got his buy-in, too. As I, he sees the value of it. The whole conversation here around security is so often this trade-off of, do I invest in security or do I go do features? or How do I balance this? And too often, people who worry about security come across as, oh, you're overly pessimistic. You're worried about something that will never happen. It's never happened before. You know, this is all these questions that I had on that first slide. Red versus blue really changes that whole conversation. It makes us very concrete shows you what's possible. Uh, Calypso monitors are interesting because Calypso is a service that, that you can essentially think of today as a scheduler. It's basically running <laughs> queries in Kusto, Azure Log Analytics, running queries in Azure Log Analytics. And it's running queries where you expect to get zero results. So I'll give you an example of one that we've created. If you were to able to remotely exploit uh, a bug in anything, be it our code, be it Windows, be it whatever, and let's say that as part of that exploit, you were going to run PowerShell, encoded PowerShell. It's a popular thing to do. Run encoded PowerShell so you get a foot in the door, and you've got uh, basically a backdoor running at that point. Well, we have a Calypso alert that if you attempt to run PowerShell on the machine, if you attempt to run encoded PowerShell, we'll get an alert, and it will actually show up as, a, as an incident, and we'll immediately engage. We didn't have that. I mean, there, there were events that we had in 2015 and 2016 where 
you know, people would go in and they'd actually get into a machine because they'd run, they'd, they'd find some clever way to get in. And they'd put something on the machine and we didn't detect it. And so we've come a long ways in that detection. Calypso isn't something that, that we ship yet. It's something that we're actually talking to uh, the Application Insights team about making it a product, about pulling it in. Uh, I hope that happens. But at a minimum, it, it's something, if you wanted to, you could, you could actually mimic yourselves. But hopefully, it becomes part of the product over time. So part of this question always comes back to, well, what, has this been effective? What's, what's been the outcome? After every one of these events, we go file a bunch of repair items. So just like you would do for LifeSite, you do an RCA, you do LifeSite repair items, we have repair items for security. Over the course of, of the last three years, we filed 226 repair items. And we have a, a, an SLA around it. We require that these are fixed within two sprints. Now, if it's a vulnerability that you can actively exploit, obviously, we go fix it immediately. So there's a whole spectrum here, right? But going back to defense in depth, when you look at the chain of how the red team got in, we'll fix the key ones immediately. There are other things that could be used by somebody else, but by themselves, you can't use them for anything. Those become these work items that we then go follow up on. But we've generated a lot of interesting repair items as a result of, of these events. It's, it's a crude metric, but it's a way of, of measuring the effectiveness of these. All right, so guidelines. Now, if you're going to do red teaming, and I highly recommend it. I think, like I say, it changes the con conversation. But you've got you to be smart about it. So you've got to have some, some rules to the game here. And I like to have as few rules as possible because real attackers they don't play by the rules. They don't care what your rules are. But we run a business. There are some things you can't do. So for example, we don't want the red team or the blue team, but generally speaking, the red team, to do any harm. Because we run a service. The last thing I'd want to have to do is apologize to you, our customers, and say, sorry, uh, we took you down today. Because we were just running a, an internal event to see if we were secure. That, that, that's, that's not good. Um, don't compromise anything more than you need to achieve your objective. They have to actually think about things like how they're compromising the service, because they often will collect credentials along the way. Like if they break in and steal the connection string to a database, that's a valuable piece of data, right? So they have to protect the data that they collect as well. And that's a key part of, of the whole thing, is making sure you don't do things like that. We also make it off, off limits to harass people. You know, you, you, you can't go do physical intimidation. You can't go um, steal somebody's badge. There, there are limits to things to, to avoid problems. Rules of engagement. Again, I don't want to take anybody down in, the, in these things. I don't want to access any cu customer data. Customer data is, is, is incredibly valuable to us. It's, it's, it's um, a sacrosanct. Like, you can't go mess with people's data. You can mess with our data. And that's why I wrote external data, customer data. If you want to go mess with the data in MSN, it's, it's all within, you're able to do that. Now, I'd ask the red team, and I'd say, please don't take us down for a week, right? I got, I got to get stuff done. But if they want to go access data in MSN, have at it. It's our data. It's okay, but not external customer data. Um, make sure they don't weaken the protections. Like, they're going to find issues. They may even make changes that, that make things weaker. But they have to think hard about making sure they don't actually allow, make the system more vulnerable than it already is. Um, Again, don't do anything destructive, so it takes me a long time to recover. And as they pick up these, these interesting and secret credentials, be careful how they store them. So what, the, what comes out of it? Two things. That backlog of repair items, the 226 that I showed you in the previous table, and that report, that readout to the entire organization. Uh, those, those meetings are always very well attended. They're always interesting because everybody wants to know what did they break into. Um, it, it's... They're just fantastic. So let's take an example. So what, what does an unprotected share look like? Well, OK, in this case, it's the most extreme version. It's open to everyone, right? So what could go wrong there? Well, somebody created some share because this was convenient. And they put a file that looked like this there. And this really happened. So this is not the actual file, but it's close enough so you get the idea. And those accounts there are test accounts. And you think, who cares? It's a test system. Nobody cares about a test system. Well, both our red team and other red teams in the company have found ways to, somebody writes a piece of code, and they trust a test domain, or they trust 
some other service that isn't that doesn't have the same security level as production. And domain names are great for this, right? So like if you've got some test domain names and you go and create, because anybody can control them, you go create a service running on your box under that domain name, if production trusts that, bad things start to happen. Let's say you might say exchange tokens for service principles or something. Those are very, very deadly things. Test accounts are something that look innocuous that are not. So they, they start looking for stuff and they find credentials like this. And as I mentioned before, every team seems to experience this. And by the way, there have been incidents where non-test credentials, right, things that have access to certain things in production have actually been found this way. Um, it's bad. But it happens and, and you've got to start somewhere. So the first thing to do, of course, is acknowledge that you have a problem. People have checked in credentials into code. I've again picked a test example. It's actually happened with production code. It's actually happened, there are actually people who run scans on GitHub looking for keys for AWS and for Azure so they can go run their spam bots, so they can run Bitcoin miners, et cetera. Um, great thing about having a search feature, and GitHub, by the way, had to change this. Great thing about having a search feature is that you can use it to search for anything in your code, including credentials. They actually changed it to make it harder <laughs> to use their own search service to find them. Um, but here we've got a key that's been embedded in code. What do we do about that? Well, one thing you can use, and this is currently internal, but the team that owns it is actually working on shipping this. Uh, so here in the coming months this will become publicly available. But there's a tool called CredScan or Credential Scanner that will scan for patterns that resemble connection strings, passwords, etc. It's all based on regular expressions. They keep adding more and more. Uh, regular expressions, so it's, it's become very good. And we've mandated across the company that you have to run this. Uh, so it, it, then there's another interesting challenge that this team's actually already uh, dealing with now, which is how do you get this inserted into all the build definitions, right? Because in order for it to run, it's got to be part of your build it, it, for being part of your build pipeline. You can also use the same tool, by the way, to scan shares, right? You feed it Files off disk, great. It doesn't matter what the file is. It could be code, it could be files off a of share. Very, very valuable for that too. And so it runs as part of the build, and I'll show you an output from that. And uses these regular expressions to identify things. Now, there are going to be false errors, right? There are going to be hits that it discovers that aren't actually a problem. You can go annotate those in your code and say, no, 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 this isn't real. But the hit rate is, is so good, it's extremely valuable. It's, it's very much worth it. So here's an example of it showing up in the code. This, this same piece of test code got checked in, let's say, and this build, we call it the compliance cred skin build, and you can see here down at the bottom that it points out these errors. And this build is actually part of our PR. So in, uh, I think in Bill Estery's talk, he may have shown you a, a PR screenshot. In there was a run of cred scan. If cred scan fails, you cannot push your code. It's that important. Another piece that, that I mentioned here is you've got credentials on shares. You've got credentials kind of scattered in various places. How do you properly manage those? We have now moved everything over to Azure Key Vault. Uh, we used to use something that was an internal service. Thankfully, every, there's, there's now a public service. It works really well. We've, we've moved entirely to it. Everybody else is moving to it as well. And this is where we store passwords, keys, tokens, storage account keys, certificates, you know, kind of you name it, whatever it is, we store it there. But we also store our test credentials there. Now, there's a different access level. If you want to get to production, right, me, I, I can't go get the production secrets. I literally don't have permission to the production secrets for VSTS. That's a good thing. If you steal my identity, I, I don't want you being able to use me to get there. But test credentials, lots of people are going to have access to those. That's the nature of the beast, right? You've got to be able to run tests. But since they're in Key Vault, A, we know exactly what they are, B, we know where they are, and C, when we go to rotate them, it's easy to figure out how to change them. We can go to the source, we can go change them in Key Vault, and the, the changes propagate immediately. So it's important to have everything in there. And you can define different vaults. We've got a whole hierarchy of vaults. We've got, in the case of the production service, runtime vaults, deployment vaults everything in there so that we can properly manage the secrets. And of course, with anything like this, some of them expire, right? You've got a certificate, let's say, for an, an SSL cert. It has an expiration. You want to make sure, of course, you, you renew it before it expires. So uh, Key Vault helps manage all of this, and I highly recommend it. 
So let's go back to another example, red team attack. So there's a way to list. You can see, of course, administrators on your local machine. You can bring that up in Windows. And well, what could you do about this? What if you had a tool that if you run this tool, and maybe some of you have heard of this tool, it's called Mimikatz. It's a great tool. If I'm admin on a box and I run Mimikatz, I get to steal your credentials. So it was written by this uh, French researcher. It runs in all versions of Windows with the exception of Windows 10 Enterprise. You can actually turn on Credential Guard to, to thwart this. Absent that, when you run it, it'll actually go extract credentials out of memory. And you just have to have debug privilege, system account. You got to be local admin, fine. So what could you do with this? This seems like a great little tool. You know, if I got admin to somebody's machine, I can go steal their credentials. So here's an example of a, an attack. Start with an open file share. We find some plain text credentials. We find some developer box where those credentials are admin. I run Mimikatz. I now have those credentials. I now find the next computer that person has access to, and I keep repeating it until I've collected as many credentials as I need to get to my ultimate objective, which of course is to get into production or whatever. But I can keep repeating this over and over again. So the next thing you want to know is, which machines can I get into? You're not obviously going to go right click in Windows and list local administrator. That's way too painful. Turns out Windows helps you a lot. <laughs> There's this, this thing called SAMR, which is, which is a Security Account Manager Remote Query. And you can use that to list out who the local admins are. Now, the great news here, by the way, punchline is, they did turn this off by default in Windows 10 anniversary update. That was Redstone 1, which is great, because what would happen is attackers will use that capability to go build an attack graph so that they can figure out how to get from one machine to the next to their ultimate destination. There's something you have, and there's something you want, and if you can map out all the possibilities of getting from point A to point B, you can then figure out the most efficient way to get there. So there's a tool out there. You can look it up. It's on GitHub. I've got the link in, in the notes. But it's called Bloodhound. And it can take this data from Active Directory and SAMR and go figure out who's got access to what machine. And so as you find credentials, as you t pick them up off of file shares or wherever, or you run Mimikatz and steal them, now you can go ask, OK, I've got these credentials. Where can I go with that? And of course, if you think about it in a holistic manner, you're really going to think, how do I get to that destination? So you're trying to get to your destination as, in as few hops as possible. So it, it results in something like this. So let's say I've got my machine, and let's say that I'm crazy enough to have the test account be admin on it. And this has happened in the past, not to me. Uh, so, but. You go get into my machine because you stole the test account credentials. And it's a test account. It seemed harmless enough, right? But people would make it admin on their box because it made, at the time, easier to run tests. So I go run Mimi Cats. OK, not me, you. And you get my credentials. Then you go to the next machine, test SVR1. You sit on that. You run Mimi Cats. You steal Alice's credentials. Alice, it turns out, has production access. Oh, now I'm in business. I got something I can really party with. But you can also run it from the command line. You can see what it does. If you run group manager from the command line, you can list out the admins. And this, this is exactly what SAMR allows you to do. But like I said, the good news is it got turned off in Windows 10 anniversary update by default. It's a group policy. It can be re-enabled. Of course, if you're not running Windows 10 at all, you're vulnerable. As I was talking through that, I alluded to one of the most important things that's so key in a mindset shift here. Defenders think in lists. This is from John Lambert, who is the Microsoft Threat something center. I, I forget what it stands for. Security guy. He's a very important security guy at the company. Um, we just got so many acronyms. I can't remember all of them. So it says, defenders think in lists. Attackers think in graphs. As long as this is true, attackers win. Because at the end of the day, the attacker is just trying to achieve an objective. How the attacker does it is irrelevant. Like, they don't care how. They just want to find a way that gets them through it. And if you think, oh, well, OK, I've got the following things, and you think in terms of, of what your code does and how it works, you're going to lose. You have to look at all the options. Here's an actual example. It's been a little redacted. 
But this is a, from a real attack the red team ran a while back. And they did exactly what we've just been talking about. They got credentials, and they hopped from machine to machine. So they started up here on the left. They found the credentials to a test account. They found a dev box where it was admin. They then found a dual homed machine that got them to some interesting boxes that have access to production. And they won. They took over the service. The other thing to think about here is attackers have also changed their playbook. They're not necessarily looking to go hit you with malware, right? Phishing attacks are one of the most effective ways that you can attack someone. And you see in here it says this is the, the fourth circle over the, the first, second circle from the right. It says of, of recipients opening open phishing messages, 11% click on attachments. So really what I need to do is I just need to trick you in to let me in the door. How, how hard could this be or how easy could this be? So we, we run internal phishing at, attacks. And so this one, I'm going to show you a couple that we did in our team, but they're done across the company. And there are actual companies, and I forget the names of them, but they're actually companies that you can use to help, help you run phishing attacks on your own company. Because you need to get telemetry on how effective it was and who did it and so forth. So here, we ran a phishing attack. This looks like a pretty stupid message. Like, surely nobody would click on this, right? It, it says it came from a printer. And of course, we all, <laughs> all know these fancy uh, internet-connected printers. I scanned something. Here's your scanned document. Please open it, right? Great. Seems harmless enough. Maybe you scanned something recently. So you decide to click on it. Well, 19% of people decided to click on this in our team. This, this was from a few years ago. This was two and a half years ago. Because right? this was uh, May of 2015. 10% of people reported it. I'm sorry, 10 people reported it. 2%. Not a, not a great ratio, is it? Let's look at a better one. Let's do a better one. So the, ran the same attack, again the same, same time, again May. <laughs> Two phishing attacks back to back. So back in May of 2015, Windows phones were a little bit rele more relevant than they are now. So this was, hey, we're going to build this brand new Lumia for Windows 10. You could get in on this. 220 people, 42% click sign up. 37%, 37 people clicked on the last email I showed you and this one. And only 11 people reported this one to security. And the awesome thing here is it has this uh, availability of beta persistence is extremely limited. This email must not be forwarded to others. Guess what happened? Not only did they use it, they shared it with people. <laughs> so, and it's funny and it's sad. And you watch the news. Phishing is the best way to get into any company on the planet. So, I'm kind of going back to what can I do if I've got somebody's credentials? Can they send email? Great, I can fish other people. What machines do they have access to? We've been through that example. Can they modify source code? Wait, I just stole a dev's credentials. I could go find a machine that has access to production, but why not just inject some code and put it in a back door? Okay, if, if, they can, if you've got the way to check in, you could do that. Can you modify the releases? Hmm, I could modify the release definition. I could have it run an arbitrary script. That could be interesting. Can they access the test environment? As I was mentioning before, if production tests anything that test owns, Test is, of course, not held to the same security standards as production. If anything in production tests something that's less protected, less uh, maintained from a security perspective, you may be dead. You, you, may, you may get owned. And then can the, the credentials that I stole, can they get into a production environment? That could be Azure resources, could be subscriptions, Azure subscriptions, could be storage accounts, could be any number of things. So thinking about blue team response here, how, what, what does this look like from the blue team perspective? And there, there are a variety of, of, of pieces here. So we've got the Azure Key Vault. So this could include the, the test credentials, for example. Getting all those together into a single place is a huge improvement. So this was, this was as a result of, of a red team event. Uh, we realized just how poorly at one point we had managed credentials. We fixed that. Uh, remove local admins. Every, every admin on the box is another opportunity for somebody to get in. 
restricting uh, SAMR, so before it was off by default in, in Windows 10, we'd go around and turn it off on machines. Um, you can do that in, in prior versions of Windows, and I'd highly recommend it. We, we actually put a check in the build process, at the PR, and said, hey, if, if um, the build environment. So, so when you spin up a build environment, I think Bill Esri talked maybe a little bit about this, but you spin up your, your, your dev environment, one of the things we check for is, are you running Windows 10 Enterprise or Windows Server 2016 and have Credential Guard turned on? If you're not, we go poke you and, and to get you to do that. Now, one of the great things about most of the people having the same type of machine is it becomes much easier to get people to turn it on. So pretty much every engineer, okay, literally every engineer has an HP 440, uh, Z440 with a six core machine. So they're all the same. So it becomes much easier to get people to turn this on. But Credential Guard keeps Mimikatz from working. Uh, remove dual home servers. You'll, you'll remember in that graph that I showed you the real attack, they jumped onto a dual home server. The great thing about dual home server is you've got access to two things, right? All, all, the, all the better. And so anytime you've got a machine that, that is able to access more stuff, more problems. Separate subscriptions. So every service should have its own Azure subscription, its own storage, et cetera, so that if you compromise one, you haven't compromised them all to, to limit the blast radius. Multi-factor authentication, or 2FA, super important. If I get your credentials, and if there's no 2FA challenge for whatever it is that I can do as you, well, I can do that. I'm, I'm you. I've got your credentials. If I have a 2FA challenge in the mix, then it, it, it slows me down. It may stop me, hopefully stop me. And you could combine that, for example, with a just-in-time access system where you say, okay, if you want to get access to production SQL, you've got to go through and request it. You're going to go through a 2FA challenge, and then you're only able to access it for some period of time. Question. So in production, how many Azure subscriptions does VSTS use? Good question. Uh, I meant to go collect those stats, and I didn't, but it's a bunch. It's, well, there was 40 microservices we heard yesterday. So, Is it in that neighborhood? Yeah, 30, 31 uh, services. I'd have to go look. I don't remember. But, it, 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 but it's not two. But there are 192 scale units, right? So with separate subscriptions per scale unit, you're at 192 there. And then you've got the storage accounts, and that's separate. So it multiplies out pretty fast. And I, I meant to go get the stats on how many secrets we have in Key Vault. I don't think I, ha I, don't think I ever, yeah, I didn't ask for those, unfortunately. But it's, it's a lot. It's probably, if I had to guess, I would say all up, we probably have something on the order of close to 2,000 secrets of some form or another. Passwords, certificates, subscriptions, you, you name it. Separate identity for production. Buck? Oh, sorry. Where? Yes. How, how do you protect the Azure Key Vault? Because to be able to access it, you have to have a key. <laughs> so. Yeah, so n normally what happens is the only thing that can access the key vault for the keys that are in it is production. Now, to rotate them, I mean, you know, there, there are two pieces. One is I want to automate all the secret rotation that I can possibly automate. There are a few things that can't yet be automated because of whatever the thing is, the dependency is, the team that owns it hasn't, hasn't fixed that. Um, there are a few kind of external to us that I really want, but there are very, very few at this point. So I want to enable automatic rotation so there's something that's changing those secrets for us and not in this production itself doing it. So what we did is this. We actually wanted to get good at secret rotation. For a long time, it was a very manual effort. So somebody from the service delivery team, a small number of people, would have access to the production secrets, and they would have to manually go run various scripts and do various things to change the secret from one thing to the next. Starting. About a year ago, we put a lot of effort into automating secret rotation. First step there was you know, to get everything fixed so that it could happen. And while we use a common server framework, and that helps us a ton, there were still enough differences in the team that it was an effort to get there. The next thing we did was said, if you want to be good at something, do it all the time. So we've actually changed our deployment so that every time we do a deployment, we rotate all these secrets that we can rotate automatically. And that allows us to make sure that we keep it going all the time. Because it's certainly, going back to a breach response, if when credentials are leaked, and by the way, this was much more painful in the early days, red team would go through, they'd take over the service, they'd steal a bunch of credentials, and it would take us three or four weeks to rotate all the credentials because it was so darn painful, because it was too manual. 
Every time you've got manual rotation of secrets, it's like anything else in deployment, you have the opportunity to get it wrong. And we have. We've had people get it wrong. We've had life sites incidents caused by somebody trying to rotate secrets manually and getting it wrong. So we've invested a lot in, in automating that. And like I say, folding it into the, the deployment process so that every time we deploy, we do secret rotation. So we're not quite exactly where I want to be. I want to literally be able to tell you we can automate every single one of them. I've got a very small number that I can't right now. And I want to, I want to get that fixed too, of course. Question. So um, since these, uh, these practices have been there for a while, were there any considerable design changes at the application level that were made? Because most of these, as I see over here, are kind of infrastructure related, mm -hmm. but are the application level changes. So that's the first question. The second question is, can you now detect these uh, attacks in real time? Can you monitor them, yes or no? Mm -hmm. And if you can, uh, are there any you know, circuit breakers or stop gates that have been implemented to ensure that they can only get a certain set of information and not more. Okay, so starting with the first one, which was architectural changes as a result of, of this. There have been, so for example, we have these 31 microservices. They all communicate with SPS, for example, with a service principle. As part of these red team attacks, we realized we had granted too much access to some of these service principles. So we went back and set it up so that in the security service, it's locked down where if you get a service principle, let's say for code search, you can't go and start deleting accounts from SPS. It doesn't have permission. And there's no way you can change that permission. So we started locking down it's the principle of least privilege, right? The least privilege required for each of the service principles to actually uh, do what's required. Same thing with the SQL injection vulnerability story I was telling earlier. We had not even thought about, oh, well, you know, if you put SQL in a temp table, should you be able to execute that? Mm, okay, yeah, no, that's a bad idea. Turn that off. We don't need that feature. So part of it, part of it's thinking through features in, in our dependencies that we could turn off. Part of it is, is changing the, the code itself. Um, we've made other changes related to particularly inter-service communication. Um, we've, we've found issues where we were able to bypass uh, certain security checks and that's caused us to go back, for example, to our REST controllers and change how they work in order to improve uh, the resiliency there to, to the, the security checks. So there have been things like that, but they, tend to, they also tend to be more involved. Uh, and, and kind of very specific to, to, the, to our code. The second question you have, remind me what the question was. Uh, can you now monitor, monitor or detect these uh, attacks ah, real yes. time? And if you can, do you have any stop gates or circuit breakers to stop the attack? So the answer is yes and no. So if you were asking this question a year ago, I'd say no. We've never actually managed to successfully uh, do a good job detecting these. And when I say never managed to successfully do a good job, when we started doing red team attacks, they weren't very careful it, by, by design. Like they would intentionally do stuff that if we had detection in place, they would have been caught. And we all know a good attacker tries very hard not to be caught. They cover up their foot, footprints. They try not to do anything that looks wrong. They would not, for example, uh, create uh, a, a local account on a VM that happens to be named after a certain nation state that might be in the news. So th they were doing things that were kind of trying to be obvious and we still wouldn't find them. Uh, at one point they even left Notepad up with some ASCII art on one of the VMs. Uh, it was kind of cool. Uh, so we were bad at it. Fast forward to 2017, Calypso for us was sort of the biggest game changer. Because what it's allowed us to do is in production, we run Azure Security Pack, which you can get to as Azure Security Center externally. We also um, have all these, this information flowing back in the form of the various events in Windows. So if, if somebody, for example, creates a local account on a VM, we'll get an alert for it. We'll know that. But going deeper than that, and actually this is my next slide. Maybe I should just flip to the next slide. So with Calypso, we can detect things like people in, uh, trying to run encoded PowerShell. In this particular case, somebody was actually able to make use of SignalR, and they, they triggered the exploit. They were doing it through a browser, and they were able to do certain things, but we actually wrote a, an alert here. This is using uh, Calypso, so it, Calypso is just running Azure Log, Log Analytics queries on a, on a schedule, so every five minutes, and they'd run this, 
and we could detect, okay, somebody's trying to do something funny with signal R. There are a variety of these that we've, we've come up with, um, some around network connectivity, a variety of things, and we're constantly trying to come up with new ones to detect red team activity. Now, the thing that we struggle the most with, and I think everybody does, is detecting the difference between legitimate and illegitimate access. So if I steal your credentials and you're an engineer on my team, but as an, I've kind of blurred the lines here. Let's say you're an engineer on my team and another attacker takes your credentials. How can I tell the difference between you and this person who's impersonating you? That's actually very difficult. Um, and I don't have a good answer for that one, because then, then I'm looking for things like, okay, she's modifying code that she doesn't normally touch, or she's using a machine that's in Singapore, and is she in Redmond? You know, or she's doing it at 3 in the morning, and she should be asleep. Like, you're looking for signals like that to try to figure out something that should be normal, you doing development, that is no longer normal. That is still a work in progress. Question? So what's the impact of the monitoring on the live site teams, or is it a separate team, or how is that handled, and what's the actionable takeaway from this for, for clients? Okay, so the, the monitoring is the same monitoring. So when, let's say Calypso here, we, we run some query and we find there's something suspicious, it's actually gonna generate an alert that goes through the same incident management system that other live site alerts go to. So if if we're breaching SLA, if we've got an availability problem, it generates an alert. The same alerting mechanism is used for security. It's just the particular incident is about security instead of availability or, or whatever the, the particular problem might be. So it's the same thing. It's the same service delivery team. It's the same on-call DRI rotation. Everything's the same. Once it happens, you, we may in fact pull different people in to do different things as a result of reacting to whatever this issue is. And, and quite honestly, by the way, you know, I mentioned other red teams in the company do events. They sometimes attack us. The Azure red team did an event back in the spring, and we caught them with the, the, one of these queries. So, but it comes up through the same incident management system that we use for everything else. But you have a dedicated response team that once something's occurring, you have? Mm, good question. So the company has people who specialize in handling security incidents. And they work on this across the company for Azure, for Office, et cetera. And so if an incident happens, then we go look at it, and we'll go pull in those, those people. This is the security incident response team, CSIRP, C-S-I-R-P. I forget what the C is, but anyway. But the incident response team, we go contact them, we pull them in, and then it becomes a quick evaluation of, okay, what's actually happening? Is it real? Is it not real? Right? Is it a red team or, or an external attacker? And then from there, it's a matter of reacting based on what's happening, right? What, what, is, what are they doing? It could be any number of things, and that will determine the response. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're central teams in, in Microsoft. Cause, and, and the other thing that can happen, and we had this happen once. Um, this was actually back in the spring. Somebody on Twitter claimed that they had found a way to breach VSTS. That was a new experience for us. We didn't do a particularly good job handling it. We changed some of our procedures as a result. Um, but they, they, they posted an image that was redacted claiming, hey, we found a way to get into your system by way of profile. It turns out they were wrong, <laughs> which was, you know, okay, good. But the fact that they were able, to, that they did this and that we didn't handle it particularly well it was, it was valuable for us to get better at it. The other thing that's happened, you know, I mentioned the Azure Red Team doing stuff to us and, and us catching them. They, they have also done things to us that we haven't caught. And I will tell you, if, you know, again, I've been, this whole presentation is about how to change the conversation around security. I got a bit of kind of my own, a dose of my own medicine. I was on the other end of it where I knew they had breached the system. I didn't know what they had done because we hadn't, we hadn't been able to properly trace them through the system. And it's not my people, right? Because when, when it's my people, I can go find out kind of what's going on if I'm curious, right? And I'm like, this feels very different. The, 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 there's a certain level of helplessness that you feel when, when the, you know somebody's in the system and you, you're not yet able to go take care of it. Now, over a course of a few hours, we figured out what they were doing. We figured out how to deal with it, et cetera. But that initial feeling is super unsettling. 
Lessons learned. So red, blue, my whole purpose here in this talk is, is how to change the conversation, to get away from the dry security conversations where it's either people pushing back because it's never happened, or worst case is security is actually uh, security theater where you have requirements to go do stuff and everybody kind of nods their heads and they check the boxes, but they don't really do the real work. So I use red, blue to really change that conversation to keep security top of mind for people. Every time somebody says, I don't want to show up in the red team event, it's just, it's just awesome. That's, that's a measure of success. Phishing is very, very effective as an attack mechanism, so you have to think about how do you protect against that. 2FA challenges are really the best approach there. You also saw from the results I showed you of trying our own team a couple of years ago, and we've done others since, and thankfully the response rates have gotten much better. But it'll never be perfect. Every time you add somebody new to the team, it's another opportunity for somebody to get fished or not to be uh, on guard. The engineering system is important. Engineering systems are always important, but they're important for security, because if I can get into the engineering system, I can get into your service. And this is a hard one to defend against, because if I steal a developer's credentials, just like the conversation she and I were having, right? If I can get her credentials and she's a developer on my team, how can I tell the difference? So I can't say I've got full solutions for everything there, but you know, when you go back and you look at kind of how some of these things have progressed, being able to thwart Mimi Cats, being able to avoid having test credentials misappropriated, trying to stop these things at the front door, they help, and the other side is detection. Um, and like I say, some of that is still a work in progress. And defense in depth, you know, it's, it's going to happen. They're going to get in. You're best off assuming that everything you have can be and will be attacked. And so a service might be behind the scenes. It might not be publicly facing. There might not be a single public entry point to something that's running behind the scenes. But if it has access to anything, if it's at all interesting, once an attacker is in, they will go after it because internal systems be, tend to be much softer targets and very valuable. So every time you put a boundary in place, every time you make it harder, it does two things. One, it slows them down, and two, it gives you the opportunity to catch them because the more stuff they have to do to traverse the graph, the more opportunities you have to detect what they're doing. And the last thing is, is we talked about this a couple times, is don't ever cross trust realms. Don't allow production to trust anything else that's not production. It, it, it's subtle, but it's a great way to get in. And on that note, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.